I'm David Friedman. A, a few days ago, I found myself in a conversation with a stranger defending my father's views about getting the government out of education. Uh, the man I was arguing with responded that education was too important to be left to the free market. It seemed to me he had it exactly backwards. Uh, if I had my choice, I'd like to get the government out of both delivering the mail and running the schools. But if I had to choose, I'd leave them with the mail. After all, if the government is in charge of delivering the mail, all that means is that some of our letters get lost. Uh, if governments are in charge of running the schools, uh, that means that some of our children never learn to read. Uh, education is important. Uh, it's not the only important thing. Uh, consider the same argument applied to food. Surely food is a very important thing. And so if important things should be done by government, it, seems to imply that the government ought to take over the supermarkets and the farms. Uh, the experiment has been tried. Uh, in the 1930s in Russia, Stalin collectivized agriculture. The government took over the schools. And several million Ukrainians starved to death. It reminds me of a conversation I had more than 20 years ago uh, with a couple of Czech students in, in Vienna. Uh, that was the summer that Czechoslovakia tried a little prematurely uh, to move away from communism, uh, and the Russians invaded them. Uh, the students I was talking with had been caught outside of the country at the time of the invasion and were in Vienna trying to decide whether or not they should go home. Uh, and they were trying to explain to me what the Czech reformers were trying to do. As they described it, they wanted the best of capitalism and of socialism. Uh, and part of that was that they wanted to have free market prices for most goods but have the government control the prices of a few essential commodities, such as bread and milk. And my response, of course, was that if the free market was really better for the other things, then it was even more important to use the free market for essential commodities. Uh, I may have misunderstood them at that point, because I don't speak Czech and their English wasn't very good. But I think they said was, yes, that's what our professors say, too. And I figured at that point I knew why the Russians invaded. So I guess what I'm trying to say uh, is that I agree that education is important, uh, and it's far too important to be left uh, to the government. Human and political freedom has never existed and cannot exist without a large measure of economic freedom. Freedom is making choices. What's best for me? What do I want to do? We all want to be free to choose. No government official is telling these people what to do. Parental control. Parents choosing the teacher. Parents monitoring the schooling. Free to live your own life, pursue your own goals, chase your own rainbow. Without the government breathing down on your neck or standing on your shoes. Most of us would choose prosperity if we could. But what's the best road to that goal? Free trade set off a process that revolutionized Japan and the lives of its people. The pilgrims tried a form of socialism over 300 years ago. Unfortunately for their fair-minded plans, they prospered only after they were allowed to keep for themselves all the food they grew. Who says economic institutions don't matter? We may dream of a perfect world, but we all know that's not possible. Hong Kong is very far from utopia. Life is unfair. There's nothing fair about one man being born blind and another man being born with sight. I do not know any exception to the proposition that if you compare like with like, the freer the system, the better off the ordinary poor people have been. Dr. Friedman has spent a lifetime studying freedom and prosperity. To him, the lessons of history are clear. People are better off making their own choices, better off not relying on government. Free to choose is a survival kit for you and for liberty. These youngsters are beginning another day at one of America's public schools, Hyde Park High School in Boston. What happens when they pass through those doors is a vivid illustration of some of the problems facing America's schools. <laughs> They have to pass through metal detectors. They're faced by security guards looking for hidden weapons. They're watched over by armed police. Oh, 
Isn't that awful? What a way for kids to have to go to school through metal detectors and to be searched. What can they conceivably learn under such circumstances? Nobody is happy with this kind of education. The taxpayers surely aren't. This isn't cheap education. After all, those uniformed policemen, those metal detectors have to be paid for. And what about the broken windows and the torn school books and the smashed school equipment? The teachers who teach here don't like this kind of situation. The students don't like to come here to go to school. And most of all, the parents, they are the ones who get the worst deal. They pay taxes like the rest of us. And they are just as concerned about the kind of education that their kids get as the rest of us are. They know their kids are getting a bad education but they feel trapped. Many of them can see no alternative but to continue sending their kids to schools like this. To go back to the beginning, it all started with the fine idea that every child should have a chance to learn his three R's. Sometimes in June, when it gets hot, the kids come out in the yard to do their lessons, all 15 of them, ages 5 to 13, along with their teacher. This is the last one-room schoolhouse still operating in the state of Vermont. That is the way it used to be. Parental control, parents choosing the teacher, parents monitoring the schooling, parents even ch getting together and chipping in to paint the schoolhouse as they did here just a few weeks ago. Parental concern is still here, as much in the slums of the big cities as in bucolic Vermont. But control by parents over the schooling of their children is today the exception, not the rule. Increasingly, schools have come under the control of centralized administrations, professional educators deciding what shall be taught, who shall do the teaching, and even what children shall go to what school. The people who lose most from this system are the poor and the disadvantaged in the large cities. They are simply stuck. They have no alternative. Of course, if you're well off, you do have a choice. You can send your child to a private school, or you can move to an area where the public schools are excellent, as the parents of many of these students have done. These students are graduating from Weston High School in one of Boston's wealthier suburbs. Their parents pay taxes instead of tuition, and they certainly get better value for their money than do the parents in Hyde Park. That's partly because they've kept a good deal of control over the local schools. And in the process, they've managed to retain many of the virtues of the one-room schoolhouse. Andrew Green, Margaret R. Story. Students here, like Barbara King, get the equivalent of a private education. They have excellent recreational facilities. What is his, how does his plan differ? They have a teaching staff that is dedicated and responsive to parents and students. Barbara. Nice decisive, he's a red hat. There's an atmosphere which encourages learning. Yet the cost per pupil here is no higher than in many of our inner city schools. The difference is that at Weston, it all goes for education and that the parents still retain a good deal of control. Unfortunately, most parents have lost control over how their tax money is spent. Ava Bell goes to Hyde Park High. Her parents, too, want her to have a good education. But many of the students here are not interested in schooling. And the teachers, however dedicated, soon lose heart in an atmosphere like this. Ava Bell's parents are certainly not getting value for their tax money. I think it's a shame, really, that parents are being ripped off like we are. When I say I'm talking about parents like me that work every day, uh, scuffle to try to make, a, you know, to try to make ends meet. Uh, we send our kids to school hoping that they'll receive 
something that will benefit them in the future for when they go out here and compete in the job market. Uh, unfortunately, that, uh, none of that is taking place out at High Park. Children like Ava are being shortchanged by a system that was designed to help them. But there are ways to give all parents more say over their children's schooling. This is a fundraising evening for schools supported by a voluntary organization, New York's Inner City Scholarship Fund. The prints that have brought people here have been loaned by a wealthy Japanese industrialist. Events like this have helped raise $2 million to finance Catholic parochial schools in New York. The people here are part of a long American tradition. The results of their private voluntary activities have been remarkable. This is one of the poorest neighborhoods in New York City, the Bronx. Yet this parochial school, supported by the fund, is a joy to visit. Boys and girls, we're going to start the workshop now. You start out with task one, put the words in alphabetical order. The answers are on my... The youngsters here, from poor families, are at St. John Chrysostom's because their parents have picked this school. And their parents are paying some of the costs from their own pockets. The children are well behaved eager to learn. The teachers are dedicated. Behavior, consistent, contrary, destruction. How old are you, honey? Six. Six. What are you working on? The cost per pupil here is far less than in the public schools. Yet on the average, the children are two grades ahead. That's because teachers and parents are free to choose how the children shall be taught. Private money has replaced tax money. And so control has been taken away from the bureaucrats and put back where it belongs. This doesn't work just for younger children. In the 60s, Harlem was devastated by riots. It was a hotbed of trouble. Many teenagers dropped out of school. Groups of concerned parents and teachers decided to do something about it. They used private funds to take over empty stores, and they set up what became known as storefront schools. One of the first and most successful was Harlem Prep. It was designed to cater to students for whom conventional education had failed. Kennedy was a very dangerous president in the sense that he was excessively popular. Many of the teachers didn't have the right pieces of paper to qualify for employment in public schools. That didn't stop them from doing a good job here. A lot of the students had been misfits and dropouts. Here they found the sort of teaching they wanted. After all, they had made a deliberate choice to come to Harlem Prep. It was a very successful school. Many students went on to college, and some to leading colleges. But after some years, the school ran short of cash. The Board of Education offered Ed Carpenter, the head of the school and one of its founders, tax money, provided he would conform to their regulations. I, I, I love him, and we got along, and he, he, I know he's busy, but sometimes... After a long battle to preserve independence, he finally gave in. The school was taken over by bureaucrats. And I, I, I know he doesn't, but I was a little bit hurt. And basically we have uh, three. I felt that a school like Harlem Prep would certainly die and not prosper under the rigid bureaucracy of a board of education. We had to see what was going to happen. I didn't believe it was going to be good. I am right. What has happened since we've come to the board of education is not all good. It's not all bad, but it's more bad than good. Now, again, we divide things into categories, but the categories really what? The school may not look not different yet, exist. but 30 of the former teachers have gone. Ed Carpenter has resigned. The school is being moved to a traditional school building. No one, except maybe the bureaucrats, is very optimistic about its future. Unfortunately, the strangling of successful experiments by bureaucrats is not unusual. The same thing happened in California at a place called Alum Rock. For three years, parents at this school could choose to send their children to any of several specially created mini schools, each with a different curriculum. 
The experiment was designed to restore choice to those who were most closely involved, the parents and the teachers. Probably the most significant thing that happened was that the teachers, for the first time, had some power, and they were able to build the curriculum to fit the needs of the children as they saw it. The state and uh, local school board did not dictate the kind of curriculum that was used in the Cullum School. The parents became more involved in the school. They attended more meetings. Also, they had a power to pull their child out of that particular mini school if they chose another mini school. Yeah, at least in my opinion, was... Giving parents greater choice had a dramatic effect on educational quality. In terms of test scores, this school went from 13th to second place among the schools in its district. But the experiment is now over. When school resumed after the summer vacation, this was just another public school, back in the hands of the bureaucrats. Giving parents a choice is a good idea, yet it always meets with opposition from the educational establishment. This is Ashford, a town in the south of England. For four years, there have been efforts here to introduce an experiment in greater parental choice. Parents would be given vouchers covering the cost of schooling. They could use the voucher to send their child to any school of their choice. I have long believed that children, teachers, all of us, would benefit from a voucher system. But the headmaster here, who happens also to be secretary of the local teachers union, has very different views about introducing vouchers. We see this as a barrier between us and the parent. This sticky little piece of paper in their hand, um, coming in and under duress, you will do this or else. We make our judgment because we believe it's in the best interest, in the best interest of every Willie and every little Johnny that we've got. And not because someone's going to say, if you don't do it, we will do that. It's this sort of philosophy of the marketplace that we object to. In other words, Mr. G objects to giving the customer, in this case the parent, anything to say about the kind of schooling his child gets. Instead, the bureaucrats should decide. We are answerable to parents through our governing bodies, uh, through the inspectorate to the Kent County Council, and through Her Majesty's, uh, Her Majesty's inspectorate to the Secretary of State. Uh, these are people, professionals, who are able to make professional judgments. But things look very different from the point of view of parents. Jason Walton's parents had to fight the bureaucracy, the professionals, for a year before they could get him into the school that they thought was best suited to his needs. As the present system stands, I think virtually parents have got no freedom of choice whatsoever. They are told what is good for them by the teachers. They are told that the teachers are doing a great job and they've just got no say at all. If the voucher system were introduced, I think it would bring teachers and parents together, I think closer. A parent that is worried about his child would send, would remove their child from a school that wasn't giving a good service and take it to one that was. And if a school is going to crumble because it's got nothing but vandalism, it's generally slack on discipline and the children aren't learning, well, that's, that's a good thing from my point of view. Even good schools like this would benefit from a voucher system, from having to shape up or see parents take children elsewhere. But that's not how it looks to the headmaster. I'm not sure that parents know what is best educationally for their children. They know what's best for them to eat. They know the best environment, environment they can provide at home. But we've been trained to ascertain the problems of children, to detect their weaknesses, to put right those things that need putting right. And we want to do this freely, with the cooperation of parents, and not under, under any undue strains. Well, I, I can understand the teacher saying, yes, it's a gun at my head, but they've got the same gun at the parents' head at the moment, 
the parent goes up to the teacher and, and says, well, I'm not satisfied with what you're doing, and the, and the teacher can say, well, tough. You can't take him away, you can't move him, you can't do what you like, so go away and stop bothering me. That can be the attitude of some teachers today, and often is. But now that the positions are being reversed and the roles are changed, I can only say tough on the teachers. Let them pull their socks up and give us a better deal and let us participate more. In America, there is one part of education where the market has had extensive scope. That's higher education. These students attend Dartmouth College, a private school founded in 1769. The college is supported entirely by private donations, income from endowment, and student fees. It has a high reputation and a fine record. 95% of the students who enroll here complete their undergraduate course and get a degree. The students here pay high fees, fees which cover most of the cost of the schooling which they get. Most of them get the money from their parents, but some are on scholarships provided either by Dartmouth or by outside sources. Still others take out loans to pay the costs of schooling, loans which they will have to pay back years later. Still others work either during the school year or during the summer to pay the costs. Many students work in the college's own hotel. This girl is helping to pay her own way, which is pretty good evidence that she's serious about getting an education. Sure, it's a lemon and butter sauce. Would that be okay? Parents of prospective students come here on shopping expeditions to check out the product before they buy. What you have here is a private market in education. The college is selling schooling. The students are buying schooling. And as in most such markets, both sides have a strong incentive to serve one another. For the college, it has a strong incentive to provide the kind of schooling that its students want. If it doesn't, they can simply pick up and go elsewhere. For the students, they want to get their money's worth. They are customers, and like every customer everywhere, they want to get full value for the money they are paying really would like to know where the chromium is binding on these uh, nucleotides. There is some stuff here on this one. Full program in the students, in effect, earn part of their keep by helping to solicit alumni for contributions, knowing full well that they will be solicited in their turn. We could get any sort of pledge from you. It would be greatly appreciated. It's another way in which the real value of education is brought home. Right. Well, Thank I you can't very tell much, you how much the alums... Um, really, it's because of your donations and people like you that I'm able to go to Dartmouth. Otherwise, I'd be paying more than $12,000. Well, like, thank you. You pay about 50 percent of our tuition. I don't know if you're aware of it. Oh, that's fine. Right. Actual pledges. This may not be the usual idea of an economic market, but it is nonetheless a marketplace where buyers can choose and sellers must compete for custom. What happens when the educational market is distorted? Look at state colleges and universities. Their fees are generally very low, paying for only a small part of the cost of schooling. They attract serious students just as interested in their education as the students at Dartmouth or other private schools. But they also attract a great many others. The University of California at Los Angeles. For those students who are here as a pleasant interlude, going to class is the price they pay to be here, not the product they are buying. We frequently wind up with uh, people who cannot compete favorably with, with even the average person here. The justification for using tax money to support institutions like this is supposed to be so that every youngster, regardless of the income or wealth of his parents, can go to college. A few youngsters from poor families are here, but not very many. Most of these students are from middle and upper income families, yet everybody, whatever his income, pays taxes to help support these institutions. That is a disgraceful situation. It's hardly what public education was all about. These students are being subsidized by people who will never go to college. 
Only about half of those who enroll at UCLA complete the undergraduate course. Compare that with the 95% at Dartmouth who finish the work for their degrees. What a waste of student time, and what a waste of taxpayers' money. What should we do about this disgraceful situation? We must have a system under which those who are not able or do not go to college are not forced to pay for those who do. As we've seen, the market works in education. When people pay for what they get, they value what they get. The market works in higher education. The state of being uneducated, you don't know enough. It can also work at the level of primary and secondary education. Ignorance, right. Ignorance. Until we change the way we run our public schools, far too many children will end up without being able to read, write, or do arithmetic. That's not what any of us wants. The system is not working. And it is not working because it lacks a vital ingredient. The experts mean well, but a centralized system cannot possibly have that degree of personal concern for each individual child that we have as parents. The centralization produces deadening uniformity. It destroys the experimentation that is a fundamental source of progress. What we need to do is to enable parents, by vouchers or other means, to have more say about the school which their child goes to, a public school or a private school, whichever meets the need of the child best. That will inevitably give them also more say about what their children are taught and how they are taught. Market competition is the surest way to improve the quality and promote innovation in education as in every other field. Welcome to Free to Choose. Joining Dr. Friedman tonight for a discussion on what's wrong with our schools are Dr. Gordon Tullock, who is Professor of Economics and Politics at the University of Arizona, and Dr. Henry Levin, who is Professor of Economics and Education at Stanford University. Dr. Levin, let's start with you. What's wrong with giving parents the choice where to send their children to school? Oh, I like the idea of giving parents the choice of where to send their children to school within the public sector and schools that are concerned about the, the social benefits of education that is creating a society where there's a common set of knowledge, social cohesion, and so on. So that would be my goal. Dr. Friedman, what's wrong with public school choice? There's nothing wrong with public school choice. There's something wrong with limiting choice to public schools. Public schools should not be in a monopoly position. They should have to compete with private schools. Uh, if you want to know what's wrong with pu public school choice, uh, tell me, uh, just look at the post office and see what's wrong with giving the government a monopoly and delivering first class ma mail. Dr. Why Dr. should, why should uh, a parent be restricted to using his tax money and the tax money that's assigned to him by others simply in, in those schools that are run by the government? At the first place, the last letter that Milton Friedman wrote to me uh, it took five days to get from <coughs> San Francisco to Tucson. I, <laughs> this is a byproduct, but nevertheless true. But secondly, you've got to remember, we let the, the parents make a lot of choices with respect to education by voting in uh, the school boards or voting the people who elect the vote boards. We let the parents decide whether we should have military forces in, in Iraq, this being a democracy. I don't see why we shouldn't let them make their decisions by themselves instead of indirectly. Well, um, yeah, my concerns here are, are the following. By the way, I should mention to you that in Palo Alto, where I am a member of the school board, so I can be your bureaucrat here, <laughs> um, we have just uh, voted in a policy that all graduates of Palo Alto high schools, we have two of them, will be proficient in foreign languages. That will be a requirement for graduation. There's no private school in the country, to our knowledge, and we've made an extensive search that sets that kind of standard. Why should there be? And why, should it, why should you? be able to tell John and, J uh, and Jane 
that they necessarily have to be proficient in a foreign language. Maybe they'd rather be proficient in music or in mathematics or in something else. I don't see that that's anything for you to boast about. Mm -hmm. it's, just an, it's just a demonstration but, but, of your willingness to replace their judgment by yours. But, but then you'd have to tell me what are your social concerns about schooling because to justify public funding for elementary and secondary schools, surely there are social benefits that are worth paying for. Otherwise, no one uh, should expect the government to pay for schools. Well, you've raised a very good question because, mm -hmm. in fact, I have become increasingly doubtful whether there is any case for government funding of schools. But the argument has always been that you need people who can read, write, and do arithmetic, who have some knowledge of history and of the, uh, of the society in order to have an educated citizenry which can, in which a democracy can operate. And I think there's a great deal of sense to that. Should, should we agree on ways of making decisions in the public sector? That is, should, should people have some notion that, in fact, we do have a system of government, that, in fact, we do debate issues, yes, ultimately we take votes tell on me issues how that, and work? Tell me how that's related to being proficient in a foreign language. Oh, well, that's not, that's, the foreign language is one concern. In other words, that's a concern that well, I but have. But where as does a, that, how, does, how is it justified? The foreign on language the grounds or, or, or language. knowledge of government No, uh, no, processes. excuse me, I agree with you that you need some mm. knowledge, and I agree. Mm -hmm. that in any system in which the government is going to provide money for people to go to school, it is not inappropriate that they should specify certain minimum requirements in spending that money. Mm -hmm. And I would agree with you that one of those minimum requirements would be some knowledge of the mechanisms of government. But it certainly doesn't include proficiency in a foreign language, but, but, and yet that's what you're proud of. But, but then what you say that we're in agreement on the principles that we should specify certain criteria for schools, but on the other hand, you're saying that parents should just have a choice of a school regardless of what it does. And no, this is my understanding no, I'm of, not saying that at all. Could I, could I interrupt? Uh, in the latter, latter part of the 19th century, uh, the schools were subsidized you could, in England. You could send the children anywhere you want, but the subsidy depended on how many children passed certain specific examinations. Uh, if 90% passed, you got a high subsidy. If 10% passed, you got a very low subsidy. You could have complete private, and these may, a lot of, many of these were church schools and private schools. You could have a very large degree of uh, autonomy uh, and a control of what is actually taught just by this examination. Very simple procedure. Dr. Well, Jellick, isn't, don't we have exactly the opposite of that now? With our, we now fund schools, uh, schools that have disadvantaged students uh, who may in fact not be doing well get more money. Well, no, that, that, that would have been true in England too. The, the special problem of disadvantaged students is, is a very real one and you don't, I don't think anybody feels that they should be treated exactly like students who aren't. The question really is, is the technical way of dealing with them, and that's not a, that is not an easy question. He's an educa educator. Let him answer that one. <laughs> <laughs> but I want to go back to this uh, other question. Uh, you, can, you can provide, the government can provide money without mm -hmm. producing the product on which the money is spent. In fact, most of its money is spent that way. Yeah. The government gives people food stamps with the requirement that it be used to buy only food. But the government doesn't run the grocery stores in which they buy the food. There is no contradiction between saying we give a parent a voucher, which may be used only for buying education in schools which satisfy these minimum requirements. There's no contradiction between that and saying that schools may be privately run. They may be run by churches. They may be run by corporations for profit. They may be run by nonprofit organizations of parents or what else. Sure, as, as long as you set the common standards. And the question is this, if you set the common standards high enough, you're going to get schools precisely like the present ones. You won't even allow public choice among schools. Uh, wait, wait, wait. You set the standards high enough, you'll get, you get schools like our present ones? I would say if you set them low enough, you get schools like well, in, present in, in terms, of, not the specific criteria, what I'm saying is if you set them in, in great enough detail. If you insist that they must be able to read, you'll get well, a different kind of school. For example, I hear you talking about perhaps a national examination, yes. and yet what we're hearing is that we ought to have choice. No, I would disagree decide. with it. I disagree yeah, I very he, much with He and I don't always agree on everything, even if we're both wearing Adam Smith ties. No, no I, I get very confused by this because people like uh, Bill Bennett and like Alan Bloom and E.D. Hirsch talk about we need a common culture and we need to get greater common content in schools and they even talk about a national curriculum and national examinations. But after all, Bill Bennett was Secretary of Education. 
I do not expect the Secretary of Education to be, to be in favor of private schools any more than I expect the Postmaster General to be in favor of giving up the monopoly of, uh, of distributing mm -hmm. mail. But, but yet he is. He feels that he is in favor of private schools, and he certainly is in favor of choice between the he public is, and private yes, sector. Yes, he is in, in favor of choice between them. I agree. But, uh, of course, the problem is what we mean by high standards. Mm -hmm. I, w I believe that marketplace produces higher standards than government does in every area. Okay, let me I don't know any area. No. The, the marketplace produces higher standards in delivering mail, as we have found out from Federal Express and from uh, no. the other private mail companies, and the mar than the government does. The marketplace, if left to itself, if not hindered, if not restricted too much, will produce higher standards in, in schools. That's why I want them. That's why I'm in favor of the marketplace. Mm -hmm. L let me ask you a question then. In a recent period, 34% uh, of the babies born in San Francisco General Hospital, which, as you know, is the largest uh, public hospital in San Francisco, were crack-addicted babies. Tell me about their parents and how they'll make educational choices for their children and in the interest of their children. When I ask if they make educational choices by voting for the school board, would it be just as bad? Well, my concern right now is I do have an alternative. If you go to the Daniel Webster School, again, right here in the <coughs> city, you'll find a school in the public sector with decentralized control and accountability with the largest gains in test scores this past year in the city of San Francisco. So I would maintain that reform is possible within the public sector. You need vast decentralization, and the only issue is whether that's possible politically, and I, sus I suspect we could discuss that. Well, our, our, would these mothers, these children you were talking about, if, would they go to Daniel Webster? Yeah, that's very important because, see, Daniel Webster is in the area where there is a public housing project, the Portola, the Potrero Hills uh, housing project. And it's precisely those neighborhoods that produce these crack-addicted babies. Uh, these but I are, they, are the mother, uh, would they, would the crack addict, you were, you were concerned about the crack-addicted mother, crack mother producing crack not being able to choose a private school. Why can she choose a public school? Well, in this particular case, I think they're fortunate to be in that neighborhood where we've tried to start this kind of decentralized approach uh, aren't you really to accelerating saying that, education. Aren't you really saying that the choice has been made for them and that you're, that you're therefore confident of that? Not, not only has it been made for them, but I think it's a very good choice that's been made for them because these particular families are under tremendous stress and simply do not seem to place a high priority on educational decisions. But I think the great defect in the kind of talk you're, uh, we're, we're hearing from you is the attempt to treat 100% treat of the people one way because 5% of the people have to be treated differently. There are disadvantaged children like the crack babies. And as Gordon was saying before, they cannot be treated like everybody else. I quite agree. No question. But I would like to have a system in which 90% of the parents, that 90% which will make sense, which, which we do trust in every other way to be responsible for their children, that 90% has the greatest opportunity to provide their children with the kind of schooling that they will benefit, think will benefit their children most. And we have special treatment for the 10% falling out. Now, you take your, your, your Public school, public school or government school in San Francisco. Of course there are exceptions in the public school system. There always have been. We showed one in the film of the school outside Boston, which was a very good school for a different reason. The problem is they don't last. And the problem is that they cannot become general because there is no mechanism for getting rid of the bad schools. There's no effective accountability. And the only effective accountability you can have is the right of the customer to say, I won't buy or I will buy. Let me ask another question, Dr. Friedman. Um, what about the schools? Will they be required to take all children uh, once the no. parents have made the choice? No, not at all. Any more than restaurants are required to admit all customers. Well, they are required to admit all customers on the basis of race. There yes, I would in that case. I, I do, again, I'm saying that the, uh, the use of the voucher can be contingent on certain requirements. And I think it is generally agreement, agreed that non-discrimination with respect to race would be one of them. N now, it's an interesting thing, in fact, that in the private religious schools, the Catholic religious mm -hmm. schools, they tend on the whole to have a larger mixture of minorities than, mo than most so-called public schools. And the reason is very simple. The, p the minority parents get such bad schooling in the areas where they are that even though many non-Catholics, for example, the, the proportion of blacks in Catholic primary schools is very high. I've forgotten what it is. 
but they get a better schooling there. Mm -hmm. They feel they have better discipline. And they're willing to pay for it. And they're willing and, to pay for it. But if that's true, it's interesting that the Coleman results show that although the private schools outperform the public schools academically, it's by a very small amount. That is, the private schools adjusting for race and social class are about the 52nd percentile relative to the public schools being at the 50th percentile. And what's of interest to me is why is it that 48% of private school children are performing below the average for public school children? The answer to that is that you have, you have only a very limited degree of competition in the private schools. The Catholic schools and the parochial schools in general have a comparative advantage over strictly private schools. Here you have somebody down the street who's giving something away for free, and you're going to try to sell it. It's kind of difficult to do. The Catholics, or the you know, Christians, the, uh, I mean the other forms of Christian schools or Jewish schools, any of the parochial schools, are part of an institution which is willing to subsidize that process. And therefore, there is very, only a very small area of strictly private profit market oriented schools. Mm -hmm. And if you had that, I think the performance would go up enormously. If you look at certain areas where you do have private schools, like in training uh, television technicians and the like, they perform extremely no, well. No, no, we have to talk about that sector because that's a very interesting sector. The guaranteed federal loans, as you know, apply to the post-secondary proprietary schools as well as colleges and universities. And a whole sector has risen to serve the poor. And a that sector, sector, but those guaranteed loans have become a scandal. That's absolutely right. And they become a scandal mostly in this post-secondary sector, post-proprietary institutions that serve the poor. They get them to sign these of forms. Course, they, of course. And you, you know this, terrible, this system. It's terrible. It's disgraceful. And there are 70 to 80 percent loan defaults that the, all of us at this table are paying for. Of course, a very small relative to the savings and loans uh, d debacle. But in fact, there's a market, and people are making choices. But I'm not, in, as you know, I'm not in favor of that system. As I said before, and as I, uh, I'm not in favor of the government subsidizing the people who are going into higher education. That's a very different question. But or, it does show how, how a market would work when people are given the power of a voucher uh, when to they purchase spend education. Somebody, uh, yes, but the point is they're not spending their own money. They're not spending the money that is being to, uh, provided to them. Uh, take, let's take a very different case. Well, you credit, uh, credit. If you don't, if uh, people who are permitted to borrow money and not pay it back will do badly in any place. That, that, or I think we can agree there is a government function which is making people who borrow money repay their debts. Uh, whether whether the debts are, are borrowed for that purpose or to buy a car. But what is the distinction between higher education and elementary and secondary education? Very simple. Elementary and secondary education is compulsory. And you would favor that? No, I don't. At would one it? point, I did favor it. But the more I have studied it, the more I have believed that the extent of schooling that would be voluntarily attained would be large enough so that there would be no additional advantage in compelling the small number who were left. That is, if without compulsion, only 50% of children would go to school, then I would have to say, compulsion can be justified because of the importance of having a school population. But I have become persuaded that if there were no compulsion, 90% of the kids would go to schools. And this therefore, I no longer see the necessity of compulsion. This, in fact, was true in uh, <coughs> England before they introduced the public school system. Ed West, I think it's higher than 90. I think it's 95 or 97 percent. And, uh, it was his work that persuaded me of that. Yeah, well, it's okay. But he, he also looked at the United States, and it's very hard to get this in the United States because of the state, different state states by are state. different. The schooling of children occurs at the intersection of two basic rights. One is the right for me to bring up, and I have five children and a grandchild, but the right for me to bring up my children the way that I see fit. The other right is the right of a nation to school its children or to reproduce values and attitudes and knowledge that help to sustain the particular things, including respect for these various amendments that the nation stands on. Uh, it would be wonderful if there were no conflict between the two, but the fact of the matter is we know historically there has been conflict between the but two, the and the question is how we're going to resolve that conflict. But at the moment, I think the conflict is produced by the public school system. I think it is disgraceful that this is, as I understand it, the first generation in American history that is going to be more poorly schooled than its parents. And I see no way you can defend and no. say that somehow this conflict you've described 
can justify the kind of school system we have, and you don't. Well, I'm trying to look though, for your insights into how we solve this, because we agree on the problem. The question is the solution. Now, American children apparently watch 19 and a half hours of television a week, according to one of the Gallup polls that I saw. Japanese children watch about two and a half hours. Uh, I think we agree that commercial children's television is not what we'd like it to be educationally. They, and yet they, usually the very walk they usually walk adult television. That's even worse. But are you talking about more yeah. control rather but, but, than but, less but, control? But, well, the question that I have is this. The same parents now who simply derogate responsibilities for most of the education of their children outside of the school to a TV set that's showing inane kinds of experiences are the same parents who are very sensitive and concerned. I think we have to help them to become better parents. I think we have to work with them. We. But I don't think that if, as we sit here now, the the way? Way? I think that all educational professionals are responsible for working but with the parents and for children. The, the educational professionals who are going to make any decisions of this sort are those who have either directly or indirectly been selected by the parents. You have to remember this is a democracy. We vote for these things. We all agree on the critical importance of education. I hope you've enjoyed our discussion and that it will continue to provoke your thoughts on who should choose our children's school. Next week on Free to Choose, we'll be discussing an issue of critical importance to the founding of this nation, equality and the rights of the individual. Much of the moral fervor behind the drive for equality comes from the widespread belief that it is not fair that some children should have a great advantage over others simply because they happen to have wealthy parents. Of course it's not fair. But is there any distinction between the inheritance of property and the inheritance of what at first sight looks very different? <laughs>